Hello, this is part three of the Silicon Valley presentation. In this part, I'm kind of showing off how I combined um, our app story with our data on SharePoint. Um, in this case, it's kind of like a way of kind of showing off how we can use related lists um, because um, if you recall from other conversations, we have two lists on SharePoint. Um, let's look at those lists. So I'm going to put this app in edit mode and I'm going to do view data sources. I don't know if you knew that when you add a SharePoint data source, you actually um, can just edit them directly from the app by clicking edit data. And now kind of open up that SharePoint list so that we could look at it. And we have a list of contractors in this list. Now I was doing some testing. These two are wrong. So removing those. Basically, we have four contractors, A, B, C, and D, and they have a contract value, they have a start and end date, they have a phone number, they have an email address, and they have a website. So this kind of stays the same. This is pretty static. However, at the end of every month, when the change order process goes through, the actual baselines will change if there is a difference in the approved cost of the project. So this list is basically static, but it's updated by flow when things are approved at the end of each month. Now, uh, looking up to this list is a list called potential change orders. And this has all the change order requests that came in from contractors. And so, uh, each request is marked as a cost impact or a schedule impact. Cost meaning requires some money changing, you know, adjusting of the contract value. And schedule is about time. Do we need more days or less days to accomplish something? And then each one are looking up to two lists, the contractor list I just showed you and a project list uh, that lists all the projects. Uh, in this particular app, I'm going to use the contractors and the change orders, and I'm not going to add the projects. All right. So that's basically how we got this data going. And then we made this app, um, just to kind of walk you through the app. Um, over here, we have a, a gallery and this gallery is basically hard coded to these five values. Um, Let's filter by only the items that have not been approved yet. So they're pending. Um, let's filter to the approved items. And you can see all the items that have been approved already. Uh, the cost impacts can be filtered independently from the schedule impacts. On this, I want to point out that I'm using a little icon here to represent cost. And underneath that icon is the cost impact. And then I have schedule here. And you'll see a little calendar icon and a um, number of days involved in the schedule impact. If it's if it's a positive number, it's more time needed. If it's a negative number, it'd be less time needed. Um, the schedule uh, impacts are approved by the uh, scheduler, and so they're all approved. But the cost impacts will take probably. A longer time because they have to go through an assessment um, and again this is fictitious but it's a typical business scenario especially when you're doing construction projects you have to manage any cost or schedule changes against the program or project schedule all right now uh, up here at the top you'll notice and I'm actually summing what's on the screen so since there is no cost impacts it's only summing the number of requests here since um, we're, we are talking about money, this is summing the cost impacts, and this is, again, summing the number of requests. So uh, these are all looking at numbers and kind of giving you an idea of what's on the screen. Now, what's interesting here is I suggested that we that you kind of use your gallery for this, and uh, let me show you what I mean here. So this, this guy in the middle of the screen here, is a single gallery and it's called gallery change requests right and it has a um, items property in it that react to what you've clicked 
on the left. So basically it's a switch function that's basically saying if you picked, you know, pending, then you want to, uh, you want to filter the list by, um, you want to filter the list by what's, what, what is not approved. So we're approved equals zero, right? Um, for cost, we want to, we want to filter by where impact type is cost. Now note that in the impact type, this is a, a choice list. Um, and so because it's a choice list, we could have a delegation issue if there were over the amount of items that are in my app settings. So in my app settings, if I go to advanced settings, you see that I have a delegation limit of 500 items. And you know what? In this particular case, I'm happy with that because this list will never have more than 500 items. What we do is we manage the current month change orders in the potential change order list. At the end of the month, all the approved change orders literally move to the change order list, which records all pre-approved change orders. And we may actually connect Power BI to that one to look back in time. But this list always stays to the current month. And if we start getting the need to increase this to 2000 change orders, we've got a much bigger problem than delegation to deal with. So we actually intentionally keep this low because the list uh, theoretically will remain low. Okay, so we don't have to worry about any of these delegation warnings because our list is not gonna exceed the number of items in the limitation, okay? Um, so that's the first thing. Then if you look up here at the second thing that we did is if up here in the actual, um, label, I have actually combined a, a little, a little, uh, total. So a sum, if you notice right here, we're summing what's in the gallery by cost estimate. And so no matter what's in the gallery, when the gallery filters, it will never sum beyond the gallery. This protects me from a um, delegation limit because it's always going to refer to the amount of items in the gallery. Again, though, we will never exceed 500 change orders in a month, so there's no need to worry about delegation. But by, by summing on the gallery, I have less, less of a chance of getting delegation limitations that I would if I were to sum the actual SharePoint list. On here, I'm counting rows. So I'm counting rows of all items in the gallery, which gives me the number of requests that are visible. So some very easy low hanging fruit here. You might've noticed in the switch statement, I've included a starts with to enable them to do a little bit of searching in addition to the filter. So if I wanna search by removal, it will dynamically search not only by what's selected on the left, but also by what starts with removal. And of course I use starts with because I know I have a risk of delegation, even though I don't in this case, I just get in the habit of using functions that are less likely to cause delegation issues. And so we got a really interesting, fun kind of UI for browsing our, um, change requests. Now I'm going to zoom into one of these, what I call them, they're my own little design, the cards. So we can talk about this card. Now, how did I design this, these gallery items? Um, just want to point out that the key properties in the way this gallery looks is I did use a blank vertical gallery, but I also um, did a few things. So this white box back there behind everything, is actually not the template the template itself. It's actually a button. So I actually took a button and made it the size of the card I wanted. And that gave me the ability to round the corners. Um, and it was just for fun. I wanted to be able to round the corners. So if we go over here, let's go to our object browser and we open this gallery up, you'll notice that this button right here, I'm sorry, not that button, this background, this background card is actually a button. If you can look at the pencil icon, this is a button. And I've actually made it a card by just putting it in the back 
of that template um, for this row and then giving it a, a border radius of 10 which rounds the corners um, so did I need to do that no I could have just made the background of the template black I mean white but then I would have had um, square corners I didn't want that so I just want to show you that and then the other thing that I did let's look at my three properties that are key to the way this looks as far as you know the size of each item there are three properties that I talk about often template fill okay in this case they're 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 transparent and the reason is because I'm using the button to set the color the template padding is 30 and that represents the number of pixels around each one of these cards right and then finally you have template size which in this case is 293 but it could be whatever you want and basically um, it represents the size of each of the um, template heights right so um, that's all that is so if you were to use those same settings and you were to put a white button on that blank gallery, then you would see um, what we see here, um, which is this kind of card-like view. Now, the other thing I did was I wrapped this four columns across, right? So this does scroll, but I also wrapped it four columns across. And if you click on the gallery again, and you look over here on the right, you'll see the wrap count is four. And that's, that's basically what makes it wrap. Also, if you notice, I always forget to tell you guys, but you can get the template size and the template padding right there as well. So um, I just, you know what, I've got a bad habit of doing everything in the formula bar, but it's really cool that we've, we've consolidated a lot of this on the right side. Um, now, interesting thing here is that I didn't just want the data from this particular list to be here. So you'll notice that this is a typical gallery. It has this item title, this item description. Um, I think this is also, if we look at this button here, this is from, this is just a button that has text on it, right? So if we look at the text on that button, it's a this item text property, just code, okay? And I think it's just that I wanted something colorful right there that shows the code. And the code represents like the work breakdown structure. So that's the code. But I also wanted to enable the resident engineer um, while they're looking at these cards to be able to reference the actual contract values today, right? So that as they make the decision to approve this, they can kind of see where is the contractor in the stream of variance between what they bid the contract to be and what it is today. Because the last thing we want is for people to keep pushing and change orders and then their original bid gets doubled over time. So these here are actually looking for data from the contractors list. Remember we said that we'd be looking up to it. So in this case, um, what I've done to make it easy to get to um, the contractor is I've got this contractor company column. And in SharePoint, I don't know if you knew this, but when you dot after a lookup column, you get two things back. You get the value or the ID. The value is great for showing the actual text, but the ID is awesome for looking up data. So that text column is just nested down to the value, but this one, this one is looking up to find out what the current, the original contract value was. And let's just stare at this function for a minute right here. So what we're saying is look up in contractors, and I'm gonna tell you why this says call in one second. Look up in contractors where the ID of this item, where the ID in contractors is the same as this item's ID for the contractor company. So we want to dig into that lookup column ID and match it to the ID in the parent list. And then what do we want back? We want the contract value. And then finally, I formatted it. Now, you're probably wondering, your, your list in SharePoint is called contractors, Audrey. So why did you use call contractors here? Well, there's only four contractors in this project. 
And even if there are a hundred, I think this would apply. I don't want to have to make a call to SharePoint every time I need to look up something for a very small list like that. It's just going to impact performance. So when I load this screen, I actually create a collection right here. I create a collection that has the contractor's data in it. Now, when I do the lookup, because the collection is already in the app, it doesn't have to make a call back out to SharePoint. And so less calls are always good things, all right? I did that for both the original and the baseline. The baseline is the, the last value that's been approved. And then finally, I added a little bit of math down here that subtracts the baseline from the original to give us a variance. So basically, if our resident engineer saw that we were starting to double this contract value, they might disagree on approving this. Like, look here, we have contractor A, whose original value was 168,000, but today they've, they've already gone up 22,000. And now they're asking for another 20,000, which means that they're gonna be over 200,000. So we might wanna to talk to them first before we agree to continuously raise their contract value. So um, I guess the point that I was making in doing this is when you're building your apps, Give people things you think they can use to make decisions, right? Don't just give them exactly what they need. Give them a little bit more if you know what kind of decisions they're making. If you can assess what risks they have, then go ahead and give them that amount of additional data to help them make those decisions. Finally, I let this toggle switch be a simple patch function. You know why? Because this approval really only takes place at the end of the month, right? So they're just marking these approved or denied. They're really not, it's not going into an effective change order until the end of each month. So because of that, I don't mind if they toggle this on and off a thousand times, as long as by the end of the month, it's right, right? Um, because the last choice when the flow runs at the end of the month to move these items to change orders, it will only move those items that have been approved, okay? Um, and so they can go back and forth as much as they want. So there's just a little toggle switch that basically um, toggles the item to be approved if it's approved or pending if it's not. So it'll, it'll toggle that back and forth. And so I chose to use a toggle switch. Now I added a little extra to this. Again, I like to give my users lots of fun things. Um, so if I approve this, so if I go ahead and approve this now on SharePoint, that has been toggled to approve. Um, and it just went off to pending the view of pending. So I'll switch over to approved and we'll see it over there. I think it was this one over here, but if you look down here on the bottom, you'll see that I added a little status bar. So every time they do toggle, if they look down, they can tell which is the last one they toggled. Um, and so it says successfully updated removal of rusted bolts, what day and what time. Now you could log all of those activities if you add to that on select a log action. And I have done that in the past. If you want to keep a version history of what's happening in your app, in an app, like be able to show it in an app, um, then you would have to log those activities and then you'd be able to show them in galleries and in status bars like I did here. Okay, so basically this was the all in all of the third part of the Silicon Valley uh, presentation and that was all about, you know, how we kind of help people um, mash data together to help people make decisions. Uh, you want to save people time when you're building apps. Don't make them jump all over the place. And I found this to be a very easy UI. You could always add additional data validation and so forth to make this a better app. In the next part, part four, number four, we're going to talk about the last screen of this app, which leverages Power BI, including a measure. So I'll be back shortly with part four of this series.